Olivier Schrauben är född 1977 och uppväxt i Belgiska Brygge. Han studerade på Konstakademin i Gent och debuterade 2006 med albumet My Boy. 2010 kom The Man Who Grow His Beard. 2014 Arsène Schrauben. 2018 Parallel Lives. Och nu senast 2020 sjörövare albumet Portrait of a Drunk. Flera av hans böcker har fått internationella priser och hans rykte växer stadigt. Idag anses han vara en av världens mest intressanta serieskapare. Boken vi ska samtala om idag heter Arsen Schrauben. Den handlar om författarens morbror som 1947 avreste till den belgiska kolonin Kongo i Afrika för att arbeta för sin kusin Roger. Redan i första delen av boken får vi veta att Arsen är en ung man med framtiden för sig. Välklädd och elegant stiger han på båten till Afrika med en cigarett i mungipan. Men Arsen är också udda och neurotisk. Av rädsla för ficktjuvar låser han in sig i sin hytt under överfarten och sitter och röker och dricker en väldig massa öl. Han går bara ut en enda gång och får då rådet av en fyllig gubbe att man ska akta sig för de livsfarliga inälvsparasiterna som finns i kolonin. Särskilt den fruktade elefantmasken som finns i allt dricksvatten. Och som kan ta sig in i kroppen via urinröret när man kissar. Och sen förvandla en mans penis till pur köttfärs. Livrädd och med tejpade kalsingar anländer alltså Arsen till kusin Roger. Och hinner knappt sippa på sin lunchöl. Innan han drabbas av våldsam, en nästan sjuklig passion för kusinens äldre hustru Marike. Kusinen som i sin tur har ett hemligt förhållande med sin skallige förman Louis visar Arsen till en hangar där han har byggt en gigantisk arkitektonisk modell av sitt stora projekt, Freedom Town. Freedom Town är en utopisk modernistisk stad mitt i djungeln där alla människor ska leva i frihet och jämlikhet. Men kusinen verkar inte vara vid sunda vätskor. För plötsligt tänder han eld på alla sina modeller och måste tvångsföras till psyket och spännläggas. I ett tilltagande delirium av erotisk besatthet, fobisk skräck för maskar och infödingar samt total förvirring sitter Arsen ensam i sin bungalow tillsammans med en struts och dricker öl. Tills han en fruktansvärd dag utses att ersätta den elchockade kusin Roger och blir den nya ledaren för vansinnesprojektet Freedom Town. Ja, berättelsen om Arsen är en fascinerande djupdykning i olika sexualnevroser och besattheter. Men det är också en väldigt modig bearbetning av Belgiens koloniala förflutna som i så hög grad präglades av utsugning och våld mot den koloniserade befolkningen. Och det har varit svårt för efterföljande generationer att prata om det här. Ett annat grundläggande tema är förstås drömmen om den utopiska världen. Och det mest spännande med är sen är kanske ändå hur berättelsen låter den inre rädslan interagera med den yttre verksamheten. Kastrationsångesten går sida vid sida med det arkitektoniska storhetsvansinnet. Den erotiska besattheten löper parallellt med rasism och kolonial utsugning. Våld och förnedring ställs mot utopiska drömmar om frihet och jämlikhet. Schrauben gör heller ingen skillnad mellan det yttre och det inre skeendet. En hallucination eller en fylledröm är precis lika viktig som en cykeltur. Den som vill läsa mer om Schrauben på svenska kan titta i näst senaste numret av Bild och bubbla där det finns en stor intervju med honom. Nu går vi till vår egen intervju och ringer upp Olivier Schrauben. Hello Olivier, uh, how are you? I'm good. 
Good. What have you been up to this week? Um, I've, every week since Corona started is the same. So I'm, I'm, I've been working mostly, uh, staying at home. And this week, Arsen Schrauben, your uh, album from 2014 has arrived from the printing press to the Swedish comic stores. And it's a fantastic, uh, quite odd graphic novel. And it's about a guy with your own name who tells a story about his grandfather's adventures in Congo in the 40s. So is this a true story, Olivier? And how did you come up with the idea? Um, well, first I must say that I'm, I started thinking about this book quite a long time ago. It's maybe the earliest attempts were in 2007 or something. So that's, I can, I can hardly remember how it exactly uh, I came to it. But um, starting to think about it, it coincided with me uh, um, moving from Belgium to, uh, now I live in Berlin. And this, and me starting to travel uh, all my 20s, I never went anywhere. I always stayed home. So when I was about 30, I started traveling more and came to live in another country. And for some reason, I, then I began to think of a fictional story that could uh, parallel my own uh, story. So I, I used this idea of my grandfather going to uh, Congo at the same age as a sort of vehicle to uh, express some things I was feeling myself. And my grandfather was, he was in Congo for a while, but nothing is really known what he, what he did there. Nobody know, knew, my grandmother didn't know, my parents didn't, don't know. So it's complete spec speculation, this uh, story. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you do any research? Um, I, I, I had re uh, read about uh, Congo for a while, but I didn't want to use this research in, in my book because the book is, pur pur on purpose, it's, um, it's in the form of a story that seems to be told but by, by somebody who doesn't know anything about what he's talking about. It's pure uh, uh, speculation and uh, uh, f fantasy. Mm -hmm. So I tried to even suppress what I knew about uh, colonial uh, architecture or circumstances and to emphasize this, the fact that it's uh, uh, like a, almost like a bullshit story. It's a complete nonsense. And this uh, is one. I, I think what is uh, really the most interesting part of the story is uh, the way you build characters. And so, so who is this weird main character, uh, Arsen, really? Yes, well, I think for me it was also, I didn't know, I did, didn't know very much about my grandfather. He was a kind of man who just was always quiet and he would, if he would, say something would be practical or it would be a joke and he was ne he never talked about himself what he did or whatever I think both of my grandfathers were like that were just quiet men somewhere in the in the background mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I I made him a very passive like uh, kind of introverted awkward person yes and yes, he's very confused. He's sexually neurotic. He's uh, completely incompetent. Uh, yeah, he has no uh, <laughs> qualities whatsoever, but some, but some, for some reason, people are very accommodating. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think this, some of this is, of his character is based on my um, kind of, um, some of it is, is actually quite realistically portraying my grandfather. He was a bit of a, dandy in some ways you like to dress well and this and that so this i put some of that in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it's based on some a friend i know and then it, it's a bricolage of different influences okay and and some of my own uh, uh, things in a way um all characters are uh, odd and quirky in in this album cousin roger is insane sexually yeah. obsessed and secretly gay and uh, his partner, uh, Louis, 
is not uh, you know quite sane either uh, and if you look at the more general way uh, in portrait of a drunk uh, your latest album we meet this sadistic drunken sailor and in uh, your earliest album my boy there is this completely mad father who has an obsessive urge to control his dwarf like son mm -hmm. So, so weird male and insane uh, male characters. That is a favorite uh, topic of yours. Yes, I think they come out uh, insane always. I don't know why, uh, why that is. Um, even now, the book I'm making now, it's, I do, I'm making an attempt to make it more realistic or more like very, they're very uh, mediocre everyday people. But still, they turn out quite uh, strange in the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But, uh, but in uh, Arsen Strauven, there is madness is a, is a topic, right? Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, especially the kind of madness that um, comes out of isolation. And I mean, the, in the book, in the, in the center part of the book, there's a a section where a scene is in a, in a bungalow somewhere in the middle of nowhere, completely alone, and that's that's where his madness is um, becomes very explicit, and he uh, becomes very obsessed with this uh, um, sickness. The elephant form. Yeah, with the elephant form, which is. Um, you never know in the book if it truly exists or if it's just uh, some kind of uh, urban legend. And, uh, and um, but in isolation, he becomes more and more um, um, goes deep, deep, more deeply into his madness. Yeah, but both alcohol and violence is recurrent subject of your stories, and in Arsen Schrauben. Uh, alcohol is, is present in an ironical way from the beginning where Arsen, you see him uh, drink this uh, Belgium Trappist beer in, you know, all the time. And uh, should get then when it, it escalates uh, and in the part at the end, Arsen is installing a large monument in, in Freedom Town consisting of an enormous uh, Trappist beer bottle. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. This. Uh, yes. <laughs> it has kind of a symbolical value when this monument uh, that is a, a beer bottle is also used as a boat uh, to take yeah. the, the colony, this uh, project, uh, Freedom Town. Mm -hmm. In a way, I I, I interpret it as alcoholism and delirium, madness. It, it represents the madness of what has come before, uh, then eventually when the, when the bottle is erected and you see this. <laughs> uh, this. Um, but I think it was, I guess I was all, also thinking about, I mean, talking about uh, uh, utopian cities. Um, when I came to Berlin, this I read about this uh, the, the city that Hitler was planning to build in Berlin, which would be called, uh, I guess, Germania or something. And he had uh, in his mind this, there would be like these uh, colossal uh, buildings he wanted to uh, erect here in Berlin, but uh, but uh, nothing of it is built except um, in order to test the ground, they wanted to. Uh, they wanted to test the ground if it would be able to carry these huge monuments. So they had this gigantic uh, uh, cement, no, uh, concrete cylinder built here in Kreuzberg, not so far from here. Mm -hmm. It's just an absurdly absurd, huge circle standing in, in like a, a neighborhood where people live. It's still there. It's like this. Uh, uh, it's kind of uh, depleted now. There's cracks in it. Now you can't you can go see it. It's just this the big. Uh... You come from a, a family with architects. My father was the architect, so we always had. Uh, he always had this. Uh, he was always making small uh, maquettes of his, the houses he would build. Okay. And then often he would come into my room and just 
steal one of my model cars to put on the on his maquette. And he had a, he had some architectural magazines that I looked through when I was a kid. Always seemed very uh, appealing. This uh, very uh, um, idealized uh, spaces of perfect architecture and suggesting kind of perfect uh, worlds. And in practice, when you see the beautiful <laughs> plants, uh, mm. realize they're suddenly in a neighborhood with other buildings. The, the, maybe the material is not so good, so it it's starts to deteriorate quickly. So often, this idealized architecture becomes uh, very um, depressing <laughs> quite quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here in Berlin, there's a lot of this, uh -huh. a lot of this uh, failed architecture, I would say, in many ways. One of the main themes in the, in the album is, of course, the colonialism. Mm -hmm. And the colonial history of Belgium is complicated and it's full of violence. Uh, and in large parts, at least, European history has avoided to speak about the aggression towards uh, Congolese people during colonization. Instead, there has been a lot of romanticizing of history. For example, the infamous album Tintin in the Congo by Arshi. In this context, I read your book, Arsene Schrauben, in large parts as a, a rewriting of history and a way to try to give a whole other perspective on colonialism. It's, it doesn't really address this uh, colonial um, past too directly. It's, not, it's really something that's more in the, in the um, periphery of the story. Mm -hmm. Especially because the main conceit is that the, the person telling the story is completely ignorant. So in his ignorance and in the absence of detail and knowledge, it, it shows something, but it doesn't really address things um, directly. No, you don't. Uh, the Congo, for example, is only referred to as the colony. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, I thought it was perhaps in Brazil or Latin yeah, America. Maybe, yeah. I purposely made it in this way, so it would be like a more universal idea of somebody coming to a, a completely unknown place without any knowledge and, and without any respect or uh, uh, sympathy or empathy for whatever is, is already established there. So it's just out of kind of adventure, but also opportunity, like opportunism. Mm -hmm. You have done exactly the same with the Arsene's private manservant, the little black boy, only called the boy. Mm. He's hardly ever depicted. He's completely uh, visible. He's not, he's invisible. And the same goes with the native people of this colony. They are not depicted in the album. Why, why is that? Mm. I, I, I wanted to avoid a kind of a stereotypical or an ironic uh, depiction. So I think I thought this book is about whatever they, the, the colonists are thinking and their uh, uh, misgivings. So I just put a mirror in front of them and everything bounces right back. So there's no, the boy is really like a ghost in nobody. It's all projection in the mind of this main character. There's nothing is really. In the in original um, scenario, I, I wanted to show him maybe in the end, but then I, I thought this is this is wrong. It's just uh, existing in the mind of the of the, of the protagonist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I kept it very vague, boy. So you don't. I think in, in in reality, boy was even used for whomever was serving in the house of the colonial people. Could be a woman, would also be dressed as a boy. I'm uh, also thinking about uh, adventures and adventure stories. Mm -hmm. um, I see both uh, your large, large narrative album, uh, Arsene Schrauben and Portrait of a Drunk, as mm -hmm. uh, a way of uh, rewriting the adventure story uh, that goes back to Victorian novels. Uh, uh, Stevenson, Jules Verne, 
H.G. Wells, those kind of stories where men are heroes and uh, the big topic is the adventure in the, mm -hmm. the jungle or, you know, the Alps or anything like that. A little bit like Arche, but for grown-ups. Um, what is your comment on that? I think I, I actually would like to make well, like a general, genuine uh, adventure story, but I always fail completely. Uh, I always start to think about it in, in a way that completely uh, undermines the, every every her heroic act that uh, the main character could. Uh, I guess it's I also talk about the anti-hero and like the underdog, uh, mm -hmm. but I also often when I read an underdog story, I think. There's too much sympathy even for the underdog. <laughs> so even the underdog is kind of dubious in my stories. He has uh, delusions of grandeur as an underdog. Or, yeah. And uh, I don't, I'm mean, like, for instance, in I say, I quite like uh, this, some of the side characters, the male. Only the main one is kind of um, um, ineffectual. Uh, a bit of a stupid man, but the other ones I kind of sympathize with more. Okay. Maybe in contrast with the absolute uh, idiocy of the main character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's also in contrast with whatever you always read when I see a popular film or a popular. Um, there always has to be something redeeming about the character, or even if it's uh, if he's a loser or this and that. So it's. I don't want to have any of these, uh, like, uh, I don't want to salvage these people. They're, they're just what they are, and they, they're made like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so it's just a way of making a thing that's more what I would want to see in other, uh, in whatever I, I see on television or read in books. So, I like also that your stories is not about good and bad. They are not moral uh, at all. Especially mm -hmm. both Arsene and the portrait of a drunk, those mm -hmm. male characters, uh, you know, the story is told, it takes a, a lot of pages to tell the story and then mm -hmm. it ends. They are evil, they are ignorant, uh, and then it all ends and nothing <laughs> happens. <laughs> I like that. There's a very subtle, maybe, insights or something but it's always especially if it's a, even if it's like two years like in absent then nothing much happens to you in this period or not in my in my um, observation of the world if i look to myself and to others not i mean your character develops slowly and you develop insights very slowly mm -hmm. so it's difficult to show this in, a, in these it wouldn't be believable i think to um, I always think that, for instance, in American films, there has to be some yeah. personal growth. And mm -hmm. but that I, is I always feel good. like they do that to make the story satisfy, satisfying and because but it, it's not really a good reason, I think. No, it's, it's completely bullshit and it's not realistic. And that I, I love that you just end the story. Like, this is a story about this completely evil drunk sailor and then it he doesn't change the world doesn't change uh, nothing hasn't happened and now it's the end <laughs> that and is portrait, brutal <laughs> portrait it's really on the forefront that's why we called it the portrait because it's like static well, yeah it's not, it's completely like, static and a circular like yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. another thing i like a lot is uh, that you don't have any distinction between the outer and the inner world in your work. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about there is no development and there is not, but there is an inner development, mostly going towards the insane or going towards a, a delirium, a mm -hmm. hallucination, uh, erotical, uh, obsessive fantasies. That is uh, a very important part of your story. Yeah. I don't know how I, I think that this this kind of uh, I like to offset like different kinds of perception to uh, next to each other, but it's also a way I kind of I like humorous stories, so, so I'm always looking for a a way to offset one situation to to another situation. For instance, in uh, 
classical um, comical duo. There is always a straight man and there's the, the clown. And the straight man is there to remind people that the, of, of the, the insanity of the clown. So I always look in my stories for something that's kind of, you go along with a certain madness and then something other happens that shows you the absurdity of the mm -hmm. situation. Because mm -hmm. if you just keep it on a certain level of absurdity that remains the same, then it's only um, strange in the beginning and then you get used to whatever the world is. Exactly. And yeah. then you, it, nothing has any definition anymore. It's, you know, <laughs> so I always look for something that's a bit unsettling that breaks this uh, pattern of mm -hmm. whatever is going on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I like it. I really like it a lot. And I read that you are connected with surrealism and all those kind of artistic movements, but you deny that completely. It's not a, a deliberate style of, for example, surrealism. Um, yeah, I, um, I mean, I grew up with uh, a poster of Margrit and one of Dali in my room. My parents put it there, so it's, I, I mean, in some ways I grew up with it, but um, I never think about it too much now. But it's all around in Flemish and in Belgian comics is this certain kind of um, absurdism that's maybe a little bit more influenced by surrealism than maybe in other countries. Yeah, it's the same, but it's also with the sexual obsessiveness and the depiction of the male organ, the penis, right. that is quite uh, you see all the time. Too many penises in the, in the box. I try to suppress. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's also a kind of re realism. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the comics are a good medium for this because to be to, to talk about sexual things but uh, you don't have to bother uh, an actor with <laughs> with uh, or whatever uh, and it can be explicit and um, so it's it's a good I, I mean it's also a tradition in comics to show uh, like quite explicit erotic things and, and alternative comics it is <laughs> it is and com uh, also this uh, the humoristic part yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's erotic in my it's more <laughs> it's another level of uh, comedy is uh, erotic comedy. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, perhaps we should talk now about your drawing style. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't been talking about that. Um, Arsen Schrauben is uh, in two colors only. That is orange and blue. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a page uh, in orange. And I'll try to find something in blue. Here is the blue. And sometimes, uh, but not very often, it's intertwined. Uh, it's also a style that is very um, simplified, uh, clean, nude, almost as it is a work in progress. Uh, can, you, can you tell us about this? Um, I this was the first book that I started with uh, instead of just making some drawings and start from sketches or whatever I found in my sketchbooks. This was started with a short story. Well, it wasn't even so short. I have it here. Yeah. The original uh, book it is very um, uh, oh, wow. yeah, kind of, and I used this. I, I didn't have the, this is the whole story of uh, Arsene just written down as like a stream of conscience. Uh, wow. it's really, if you would read it, it's really atrociously badly written. It's like English and, and Dutch, like uh, um, mashed up together. So it's really only I can also the, the my way of writing is like a doctor's writing. How so. long, uh, you say as, as a stream of consciousness, how long did it take to make that? Uh... Um, I don't know. I must have been, and maybe I did like three pages every day for a lot, for a few months or something. Okay. And then I always did it in the morning because my head is more unbothered by whatever's going on in my life. Then, so then I just, and I really didn't care if it was completely uh, uh, stupid or. Okay. And there's a lot of things in this in this text that that I. 
eventually had threw out in the in the actual book because it was too far fetched or just uh, too uh, just not good. Uh huh. But um, and even when I was writing it, I wasn't really intending to seriously thinking uh, already to make a book out of it. It happened later on. I suddenly thought maybe I can try and see. And then did you start when you start drawing mm -hmm. after doing this uh, the notebook stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, do you start from the beginning, from the first scene, and how do you how did you decide this uh, orange and blue uh, color mm -hmm. theme? Um, I always work quite linear. I never skip pages. I always because I'm I feel like drawing it is a bit like like the writing is the planning and then drawing is like a performance. Okay. Somehow a very slow motion performance of whatever you thought. Okay. So I, have to, I would like to stick you know, with the linear uh, and with the right uh, chronology chronology. So uh -huh. I started doing it. I noticed that. I could be certain because the, the story is, is also a bit sketchy and and uh, it, the story is like you notice that the author is figuring it out as it goes along so I wanted the sketchy feeling of there's a lot of empty spaces and, and things that are not clear and I, and after I had a few pages I thought okay maybe I can try this and then Instead of going to a publisher, I decided to print it myself. And in the other room here, we have a, a risograph printer. Okay. Like a sort of a photocopy machine with better ink. Okay. And it has only two colors, so ah. I had to choose. <laughs> <For a little practical. laughs> in the beginning, there's only uh, orange and blue. And then actually in the end, we can see this mix of colors. This is, yeah, this is only... Also a few pages it's and it's rather shocking when it comes up that's good because though that was the idea uh, it had to be on another level of like a more on this place and story this like return to normalcy so i wanted to have it look more like a conventional comic yeah right and so it it's, still, it's still two colors but if you overlap them you can so it can have almost black and brownish colors and yeah yeah but, but Olivier, then you, you decided to do this all by yourself and you printed Eisenschrauben in uh, three parts at your Well, no, I, I never, uh, I have here the original. Yeah. Like this is the first one. It's, it's really uh, quite a crappy book if you look at it now. Uh, um, this one I made that's myself. That's a like, collector's item. How many, uh, how many <laughs> copies did you print? I, I reprinted it a few times, so it uh -huh. must have been 300 or 400 of this. Okay. And then, but I only have one left. And this you is have only one left. Okay. Yeah. And I used to cut them even with <laughs> with a cutter knife. You do. You, you did everything by yourself. Yeah, it was really uh, too much. Uh, but was, but how much time did that, how much time did it take to make like 300 copies? Uh, I don't know, but I spent like weeks just sitting at my desk, only cutting and, and stapling. Okay. I couldn't cool. brought him to a copy shop and have it done, but for some reason I wanted to do it myself. Yeah, eventually I, I sent it to my publisher and Fanta Graphics and they said, yeah, when it's, when it's done, you will be collected. Mm -hmm. But I actually wanted them to make three parts, but I didn't. That's not a good format anymore. Only my Spanish publisher still did three... Uh, like in Spanish, oh. the, uh, this is the last one. Wow, well, was that a collector's one. box? I saw yeah, this, yeah. Oh my god. This has That's a, luxurious. Wow. This is That's a, good looking. A photo of my real grandfather. <laughs> That's cute. Yeah. yeah. In the last, maybe I can, I, I don't know, this is the last part of the story that I sketched out. And oh. sort of, uh, I don't know if it's very visible. The ink is kind of was very cheap ink, so it's kind of evaporating now. Uh -huh. Probably, yeah. Uh, so here I made. It's very strange. I I, I made this the whole uh, story in a sketch form, mm -hmm. but then when I was actually drawing it for real, I never looked at it. <laughs> I just used it as a sort sort of way to uh, get it out of my like force the story out, and then I knew it. And when I actually drew it, I uh, this is one of the pages. Oh, it's very. They're all. 
I started drawing on like cheap, uh, uh, what is this, photocopy paper and then with pencil, it's really, uh, and I made the sketch in the back. Ah, okay. <laughs> a very simple. Uh, yeah. Are there any uh, certain comic creators that you prefer? Uh, wait, but maybe I can, I like, uh, maybe I can talk about Swedish one. Yeah. Like uh, like uh, Gunnar Lundqvist very much. Uh, oh yes. Of, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. I have to read it with uh, like uh, translate uh, with my with my phone. But I mean, there's not a lot of. I mean, I also like the evolution in his books. Like the early ones are very punk and violent. Yeah. And yeah. These are more like meditative. And, uh, yeah. Okay. More somber also. That's nice. Uh, and uh, so we're running out of time. Uh, but what are you up to right now? Is there anything uh, going on? A new album? I'm working on a new album. And I'm also, it's called uh, Sunday. This is, it's also, I'm also making it in uh, small zines first. But um, I'm not printing it myself. There's somebody doing it here in Berlin. Okay. That's good. And I'm doing so many because I have so much time in this Corona isolation that I'm also trying some animation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm sorry that you couldn't attend uh, the Stockholm Serie Festival this year, you know, mm. uh, IRL, but uh, perhaps next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. Okay, yeah, thanks for uh, the questions and for... Yeah. Okay, good luck. Okay. okay, see you, Olivia. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye.